Hello and welcome to another episode of the Transportation Exchange Podcast presented by Rush Truck Science of Canada. I'm your host, Jason Cuddy, and with us again today is Mr. James Menzies, editor at Today's Trucking and TruckNews.com. Welcome back, James. Thank you. Always a pleasure to, to catch up with you. So we're already at that point for this time of year. We're, we're halfway believe. through, so I figure let's just dive right in. There's a lot to talk about, yeah. so maybe we'll kind of do our normal theme as we normally do. Let's why don't we start with the uh, trailers. What's, uh, what's the theme so Tra- far? Trailer market seems to be really slow. Um, you know, orders have, have fallen through the through the floor in the last few months. And I think the reason for that is that um, the freight market is still in, in a freight recession. You know, when we were talking six months ago, we were hoping that next time it caught up, it would, it would be over. But now some are saying that this is a, the worst freight recession and the longest lasting freight recession in, in the history of the industry. So it's been tough. So, so fleets aren't out there spending a lot of money and, and updating equipment unless they have to be. And um, the order levels that we're seeing are just replacement demand. Um, very few fleets are adding capacity right now. So that's that's made for a very soft trailer market. There's still, I think, a little bit of catching up being done since COVID when there, there was the supply chain issues that we talked about and people couldn't get trailers. So that's keeping the manufacturers busy for the most part, but they're just kind of, kind of plodding along. Gotcha. And that ties right into the, the class eight side, obviously the two obviously yeah. go hand in hand and I know we see it here. It's definitely quieter, I guess is the best way yeah. to say it, <laughs> you yeah. know, and then medium duty is kind of its own little animal. It seems to be doing fairly well, I think is what yeah, we're seeing. Medium duty from, from what I understand doesn't have the, um, the severe cycles that class eight does, you know, it tends to be a little bit more immune to those swings. Um, class eight, what, what we're hearing is that the private fleets are, are really bolstering demand for trucks. Private fleets uh, couldn't get the capacity that they needed through the um, through the pandemic, and they've kind of learned that they want to take more control out of their uh, of their supply chain. So they've been adding adding trucks. Uh, vocational market, from what I understand, and perhaps you can verify this, uh, has been strong, uh, especially in the U.S. where they've got that infrastructure funding, and some of those projects are now coming coming to fruition and. Um, and they require, of course, the vocational trucks to, to get those projects built. Where the weakness is, it's uh, Class 8 line haul. Is that yeah. what you're saying, too, at the dealer level? Yeah, for the most part. I think Class 8 is, you know, quietish um, this time of year. And, and to your point, the private fleets seem to be, they're not immune to, but obviously they're not affected by, you know, rate prices and, and that part of the business. So I think they take this opportunity to top up, yeah. you know, when, when everyone else is kind of quiet. And then, yeah, we're seeing... On the vocational side, definitely an increase in um, demand. Mm-hmm. Uh, to your point, more so in the U.S., but I mean okay. we do see it here as well. And I think that's now caused you know some new supply chain mm-hmm. challenges that we're seeing with with Allison. Unfortunately, it's not what we're finding now is it's it's not a, what it was say two years ago with an inability to produce you know product. Mm-hmm. Now it's just demands exceeding the capabilities, so there's delays and you know in getting product. But it's, it has nothing to do with the inability to produce it. It's just the demand is so huge, you right? Know, and specifically with the vocational side. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Hearing, hearing the same thing. Uh, and then, so, you know, hot on the wheels of, of, of truck world, there's a lot of EV yeah, buzz yes. and, and technology there. Um, you know, what, what are you seeing, you know, coming out of truck world and just in general with regards to EV? A ton of interest. Uh, there's an awful lot of interest in electric vehicles. I think that there's uh, maybe a little bit of a pause in, in the adoption right now. I think the, the early adopter fleets have bought those initial vehicles. And now they're in the, that phase of seeing how they perform, figuring out how to um, integrate them into the fleet effectively, uh, what types of routes, what ki- types of range. So um, I think that there's a, a lot of interest, but uh, maybe a slight pause in, in the uptake. Um, and that, of course, I, I think will, will change as those trucks become more proven. Um, you know, we still have some really good incentives, especially in, in Ontario and Quebec, or um, Quebec and British Columbia, rather. So that uh, that's kind of an interesting um, an interesting landscape right now. Um, certainly at Truck World, there's a lot of interest, not just in um, electric vehicles, but other alternative fuels too. Um, you know, we saw natural gas more than we usually do, and even an electric trailer, which I found was quite interesting, it had solar panels on on the roof, and and it can um, power the refrigeration unit for up to three days while it's not plugged in. So, a lot of a lot of fleets looking, a lot of um, a lot of innovation in that space still. Yeah, I mean, to your point, you walk through the show and there's you know tons of manufacturers with with EV. Uh, I think everyone had something to show to yes. you know to some capacity, whether it's you know a class eight, medium duty, you know final mile type truck, you know mm-hmm. yard trucks uh, and and reefers. Yeah, you know, I remember we had talked to the guys at uh, the Thermal King about this about their you know electric reefers. And this is you know maybe about a year and a half, two years ago. So mm-hmm. now it's starting to come come to light, and you know it, integrating you know the, the trucks with with the equipment as well has been the biggest challenge. But it looks like everyone's headed down that path. So mm-hmm. I, to your point. As, as you know, the, the first adopters kind of proved the technology, then I think the next go round is everyone starts to kind of jump on board a bit more. Yeah, another interesting um, uh, theme at, at the at the show is hydrogen. I mean, we saw hydrogen trucks for the first time. Yes. 
and um I, while we don't really have the fueling infrastructure yet here in Canada, I was just down in, in Oakland at the Port of Oakland where they opened up the first hydrogen large-scale uh, truck stop where they could fuel up to 200 trucks a day. So that's something that gradually is building out, and uh, we'll probably see some of that here in Canada as well. Those fueling stations are, are not that difficult to create because they're built, they're modular stations that can be assembled pretty quickly and then replaced with permanent stations as, as the demand grows. So we might see more of that here too. And I think that's gonna be the next wave, right? You got the early adopters, which you know are all in mandates, funding, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the incentive is to kind of jump in at first. Um, but to make it you know viable for the industry, it becomes down an infrastructure part. And so right. I think especially from a range anxiety, you know, you get to hydrogen and class eight, I think there's a good fit there. And then mm-hmm. if you have the infrastructure that's fairly scalable, you know, in a quick time frame, mm-hmm. um, then I think that'll definitely help drive the, the growth in that product line for sure. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, you do get that um, that fueling time that's more comparable to diesel. And so if you have a slip seat operation, are you going to run that truck, um, you know, well, 24 hours a day, you need that quick fueling time. So I, I think that'll be a good option, especially for long haul and then for heavier payloads. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't, I mean, we're seeing it as we talked to people before, we don't see that same infrastructure coming for electric, at least on the commercial side, you know, right. to that scale per right. se. I mean, there'll definitely be stuff there, um, but it's definitely more of an at home kind of, you know, base where, you know, commercially, I think the hydrogen definitely is scalable and you're starting to see it, like you said, it's mm-hmm. it's, it's out there, so, which, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, go ahead. <laughs> so another thing we had, um, you know, happened to us in the last little bit is interest rates. Mm. You know, they yeah. uh, they keep climbing. They seem to have leveled out a bit, but uh, clearly that drives a huge, you know, break on purchases and, you know, and, and kind of everything to the economy in general. So what, you know, in the last six months since we last chatted, what, what have you seen industry-wise as far as the, uh, what, what impact this has had on the business? Well, I'm, I'm working on an article on that topic <laughs> this month. So I, I was just talking to some lenders and, um, yeah, it's been it's really really tough for the fleets, and uh, a lot of them are, are going back to refinance their vehicles. Sometimes they're extending the terms on those vehicles, and um, for the lenders, uh, some of them are exiting the industry. Um, you know, and they're kind of quiet quitting. <laughs> they don't necessarily announce <laughs> that they're getting out of the industry, but they just make their parameters so so difficult that um, you know just by default they <laughs> they're no longer able to to lend any money because we've seen an increase in bankruptcies, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit. But, yes. Um, you know that that makes lenders nervous <laughs> and um, you know this is a, a low margin business and so when interest rates go up significantly that's a, a real struggle for fleet so I think that that does continue to be to be a struggle and will continue because there's no indication yet when those rates will start coming down um, the economy is still just strong enough to, <laughs> to justify keeping those rates up it seems so uh, I think that's something that, that all fleets are, are struggling with right now yeah, and then tied to that, obviously you mentioned in the beginning was you know on top of interest rates going up, the general you know spot market price to move freight has gone down significantly, right. especially from the last two years. You and know, the cost so of equipment has gone up. And the cost of everything has gone up. <laughs> right. So everything's kind of not pointing in the right direction from, from a growth storm. point of view. No, yeah. No. Perfect storm, and um, and that's why we're seeing some some failures out there, which yeah. has to happen because it, there's too much capacity right now. Yeah, no, uh, fair. And I think you're starting to see, I mean, we saw it with, with yellow, you know, unfortunately, you know, I think the last time we talked, it had just kind of gone down and that, that equipment starting to, you know, get out there into the secondary market. And then, as you mentioned, unfortunately, we've seen here in Canada, you know, some, some companies have gone bankrupt just with the nature of how tight the margins are in the businesses. You know, one thing starts to kind of erode, you know, everything kind of crumbles and, you know, we've seen it here. Yeah. Starting to hear about one every week, it seems, uh, here in Canada. Yeah. And, you know, some of them are, are sizable companies and some are smaller. But, um, you know, the big one being being Pride Group, of course, and that's going to have a trickle down effect on on the used truck market, because if they have to liquidate and I, I think they have an extension till about um, end of June to, to restructure. But if they have to liquidate, there's something like 20,000 trucks under their under their control. So, yeah, you flood the market with those and then you combine that with yellows, 30,000 or whatever. And there's going to be a real glut of, um, of of used trucks on the marketplace. Yeah, that's going to be, and, and that's just speaking of, you know, one, one business. And if there's other ones that, that do, you know, unfortunately fail as well, then that just, you know, adds to the market, you know. So it, it seems to be, I guess, in some ways the market's, you know, right right sizing and correcting itself, you know, mm-hmm. unfortunately at, at, at the cost of some businesses. But, you know, I guess as that capacity will go down and the rates will probably start to climb back up for the businesses and hopefully bring the margins back up for them. It sure sounds that way. It, it seems that there's greater consensus now that um, the second half of this year is going to result in a freight correction and uh, the market will will get stronger for carriers so let's hope <laughs> let's hope because i think the next thing on the wave that you know we, we've been talking to our customers about is obviously you know the epa 27 mm-hmm. guidelines uh for for engines specifically is is 
extremely aggressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously tied traditionally with aggressive is cost, extremely yes. expensive. So you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, I don't have exact numbers, but significant increase in just the engine cost mm-hmm. to meet those emission targets. And most of the OEM engine manufacturers usually have the the engine kind of built and designed the year before, right. which would kind of make 25 the pre-buy yeah. from a cost point of view. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be really interesting because um, I, you know, the numbers I've heard is that uh, Class A truck will go up uh, 25 to 30,000 US and when that has the new emissions uh, requirements on it. So if the, the freight market is, is strengthening at the same time, then the theory is that this could be the, the greatest pre-buy of all time, especially since all the fleets have fresh in their memories the inability to get trucks right. after the pandemic when they couldn't. So they're going to be rushing to get those uh, build slots early, I think, and try to get ahead of that cost. I mean, it's not a it's not a new technology that's being brought in without testing and without like with a lot of uncertainty around it. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of nervousness about but the technology is kind of more of the same as what we already have to control NOx. Uh, it's a cost. It's you know to add twenty five, thirty thousand grand to the cost of a Class A truck. That's that's a lot, and um, so I think we could see some a couple of really really strong years, uh, especially if the freight market improves. And then um, what happens beyond twenty twenty seven? We'll have to wait and see. You know what what goes up must come down. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's a good point, right? I think the next two years, from a you know volume point of view, will will be huge, um, and it'll it'll come down to kind of also what we're seeing with the vocational side now is you know can the OEM manufacturers, especially with the engines, keep up with the demand, right? Mm-hmm. Is the capacity there? You know, you see it coming, so hopefully they can ramp up, you know, mm-hmm. to a point where they can meet the demand. But I agree with you. I think you know across all product lines, so especially Class Eight, mm-hmm. I can see a, a massive interest in getting in front of this for twenty five. You know, especially yeah. if yeah, it's twenty sevens to hit, but twenty six will have the same engine mm-hmm. technically. As, mm-hmm. as 2027 20, so 25 is kind of your last chance of you know for like the old, the old technology yeah <laughs> you know at, 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 at decent pricing yeah that, that hated term allocation that we heard uh, during the, the supply chain uh, challenges after after covid might be coming back and and uh, you know, fleets will have to put on their negotiating hats to, to make sure that they get the build slots that they need. Yeah, and then, you know, then you tie that all into, I mean, here in Canada, we're fairly, you know, removed from it, but, you know, with regards to the EPA hits, uh, you know, starting this year, there's definitely, you know, a, a one for so many ratio of, of EVs or certain, not necessarily EVs, zero emission vehicles right. to, you know, internal combustion engine vehicles. So there's that playing in the background as well that, right. you know, we don't necessarily see as much in Canada, but it still affects the OEMs as a whole, sure. as far as the amount of zero emission vehicles they need to move in order to move the amount of engines they want to move next year. Right, right. Yeah, it's quite the balancing act. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be crazy. So, you know, as a recap of uh, halfway through 24, what uh, what, what, do you, what do we think we're looking at for the, the, the second half of 24? <laughs> the, the second half, as, as I said, I think uh, the general consensus is that the second half is going to mark an improvement in, in the freight market. And, and that's good to hear. That's good for everybody. A lot of that is because a lot of capacity has left the market, especially in the U.S. There's been a lot of uh, bankruptcies and a lot of... Um, Small owner operators that, that went out there when the spot market was super hot, and now they've gone back and leased on with, with fleets. So I think that um, there's a balancing coming. Um, the economy in, in both the, the U.S. and Canada is, is chugging away. It's not overly strong, but it's not uh, it's not falling either. So so I think that when we meet six months from now, I'm, I'm hoping we can talk about uh, the industry being in, a, in certainly a better space because, uh, as I said, this is a, a freight recession that just doesn't seem to want to end. And, um, you know, we had the road check uh, blitz uh, in May, and that always brings a, a nice bump in, in spot market rates because there are those, unfortunately, that choose to take a few days off <laughs> rather than, than face that increased uh, enforcement scrutiny out, out on the road. So that's always quite telling whether that, um, that rate hike is sustained and, and how dramatic it is because it tends to be kind of muted in, in freight recessions like that has the last couple of years. Other years when the market's strong, um, that can mark a, a sustained increase in, in rates. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the the business needs it, right? Obviously, to have the rates go up a little bit to help, you know, help the companies. So hopefully, we see a uh, you know a resurgence in in that for the second half, which would be nice. And um, yeah, well, I guess yeah. time will tell us how accurate we are. <laughs> yeah, and then on the M and A landscape, it's been kind of quiet this year, yeah. and and I think that's that's not for lack of um, businesses that are for sale. <laughs> I think that um, the buyers can be pretty selective right now in this market. They have a lot of opportunities crossing their desks all the time. And um, we might see an increase in in that right now. But uh, I think, you know, there's just so much uncertainty in the market. It it feels like buyers are taking a bit of a a wait and see approach. 
um, but not for lack of, uh, of opportunities out there. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And just to, to climate in general, I mean, you talk interest rates are still high, so everyone's kind of waiting for them to drop, right? And then, you know, the, the, the price for it to move freight hasn't really gone up, and you've got an election year in the States, right? That's so you've right, got yes. a couple different things kind yeah. of that everyone's kind of just waiting on almost, right? Like yeah. it's, I, we can see it too, you know, just in general, like there's a lot of interest. I mean, mm-hmm. Truck World, you guys can attest to, was very well attended, mm-hmm. you know, from between the OEMs and just the visitors. So there's a lot of interest. Everyone was out looking, mm-hmm. but I think, you know, from what we've yeah. seen the first half, it's been muted just yeah. until everything kind of figures itself out. Yeah, Tr- Truck World was, um, we got back to our pre-pandemic numbers for the first time, so that was really good. And despite the market being being soft, um, you know, people were, were fairly upbeat. Where we did see a, a bit of um, muted uh, enthusiasm was in the recruitment pavilion, where there were fewer fleets looking for drivers. Those that are hiring right now can be more selective, which is a good thing. Um, and, you know, it's still, you never want to turn off the, that recruitment top because you know that there's going to be a driver shortage just pretty quickly as soon as the, the um, industry turns around. But uh, for now, there's, there's fewer companies that are out there actively hiring. Gotcha. Oh, makes sense, right? Everyone's kind of just mm-hmm. waiting. Yes. <laughs> it seems to be the theme so far. And then, yeah. yeah, we'll see when we get back to the other six months how much has changed. Yeah. And, um, you know, our biggest company in, in Canada, of course, Transforce, they recently reported earnings. And Elaine Bedard, their their um, president and CEO, said that, um, to your point, the election in the U.S. is causing a lot of uncertainty, especially when it comes to capital investments. So um, that's something that we might have to get out of the way in November before we really see the, the economy start to improve. Yeah, now that'll be interesting to see and see which way it goes, right? And how, right. how it responds to whatever the outcome is. Yeah. Um, you know, because obviously there's definitely, like I said, the infrastructure program in the U.S. is driving vocational. So, you know, is, is this ramp up a vocational to get in there before there's potentially a change in government? Mm-hmm. Or is it just, you know, there's a time frame involved with regards to, you know, the funding, whatever. But clearly you can see, you know, what impact, you know, mm-hmm. you, you know, because I'm sure that, you know, stuff's been there for the last couple of years. But now, you know, with the looming election, everyone's, you know, getting what they can out of it. So yeah. another real interesting aspect of the economy right now is, you know, this term nearshoring, where we're, we're hearing about more and more production leaving China, coming to North America, specifically Mexico, which, um, you know, is a real boost for, for truck freight because, um, you know, that, that freight moves by, by truck generally from Mexico up into the U.S. and Canada. So that's good to see. That's a positive trend that, that could have a lasting effect for, for trucking here in North America. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, especially we've had some, you know, s- supply challenges with, with Baltimore, unfortunately. Yes. So, you know, they're working through it. And, you know, from our end, we haven't been massively affected by it. I think, you know, the, the nice part is the supply chain strong enough to kind of work around it, just maybe mm-hmm. some delays, but it hasn't. It's, from our end, we haven't really seen a really crippling effect that I think people were afraid was going to happen with that port, such a busy port. Right. The bigger impact uh, p- potentially here in Canada is there, there's talk about rail strikes at uh, both railways, and we'll see what happens with that. Usually they get legislated back to work pretty quick if that happens, but um, that could really uh, have an impact on Port of Montreal and um, and, and Vancouver as well and Halifax. Yeah, good point. So, so things looming. So yep. it's, it's kind of an unknown halfway through the year. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say it's pretty uncertain. I mean... As I said, six months ago when we were chatting, we thought we'd be talking about the good times, yeah. <laughs> having having returned. And it's just, it's a stubborn, stubborn freight recession that just keeps dragging. But um, every day I hear more and more of the um, economists that I watch and, and those that uh, industry analysts saying that it looks like it's going to be a stronger second half of the year. Yeah, I think we're hearing kind of the same thing. So it's, I think, you know, the, the incentives there. Um, and I think if, if that's coming from different economists and different, you know, businesses and CEOs, obviously they're kind of, you know, image, you know, imagining the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as things start to trend in the right direction, hopefully that's where, you know, we'll start seeing a pickup in, you know, in everything. Hope so. So hopefully, well, we'll do this again in six months and we'll, uh, we'll see how close we were at that point in time. Excellent. Look forward to it. (laughs) Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us. And we want to thank uh, James for joining us today and to catch up on past episodes, check out transportationexchangepodcast.ca. And until next time, thanks for listening.